Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Yong Jin Kim from Korea and nice to meet you. So during last eight sessions, we talked about how to maximize the success rate of conventional and some modification of GBI. From now on, let's talk about treatment pro after extraction. Today, we will be talking about how to manage the extraction socket, especially in the anterior lesion. As you all know, during very early healing period after extraction, the thin labial bone will be gone because of loss of blood supply. Have you ever heard about bundle bone theory? Bundle bone is a tooth delineating cortical bone. The thickness of this bundle bone is around 1.0 mm, exactly 0.8 mm. Anyway, the main blood supply to this bundle bone is blood supply from periodontal ligament. So after extraction, this periodontal ligament will be gone. So the blood supply to this bundle bone will be gone. So this very thin bundle bone will be gone during very early healing period after extraction. But in the anterior lesion, two to three millimeter of most coronal bone wall, most coronal labial bone wall is mainly made of bundle bone. So after bone rejection, the coronal portion of labial bone, around two to three millimeter, will be gone. So let's see anterior extraction socket, upper anterior extraction socket, labial bone is quite thin. So two to three millimeter of most coronal labial bone wall is mainly made of bundle bone. So this bone will be gone after extraction. Let's see the CBCT. Here, on the labial side, the bone, coronal portion of labial bone is quite thin. But how about platter side? Yeah, on the palatal side, there is bundle bone, but outer cortical bone is quite thick, as shown in this slide. Palatal side, cortical, outer cortical bone is quite thick. So even though the inner bundle bone will be gone, outer palatal cortical bone can maintain the vertical bone level. So palatal bone can be maintained, only labial bone will be gone. So we should remember this to decide the timing of implant placement or to manage the anterior extraction socket. Labial part will be gone. So let's talk about treatment flow after extraction. So I always decide my treatment flow based on this socket classification. I always use this Simplified socket classification introduced by Nicolas Elian. Type 1, type 2, type 3. Let's talk about each. This one, type 1 socket. Sound, so sound soft tissue and sound bone. The page soft tissue and buccal plate of bone are at the normal level. No recession. This is a type 1 socket. Let's see. This is a clinical case of type 1 extraction socket. No gingival recession in number two one. Left upper central incisor. In the CBCT, we can check the sound labial bone level without any rejection. This is a type one socket. How about type two socket? Patient soft tissue is present, but buccal plate is partially gone, partially missing following extraction of the tooth. Here. In this case, this patient reported to my clinic because of tooth fracture, tooth uh, crown and root fracture in this area. Now, can you expect the type of this soft extraction socket? In the clinical view, we cannot expect. But in the CBCT, I, I was not sure that the labial bone was intact or not because in the CBCT, I could not confirm here. So after extraction, I checked the labial bone integrity with the surgical thread. But during checking, the labial bone was gone. So there was some penetration. So I opened the prep to confirm the labial bone missing. So you can see this kind of pre-existing labial bone 
defect. So, so this extraction socket could be classified as type two. As shown on this in this case, type two socket could be misdiagnosed as a type of socket sometimes. So you should take a CBCT, and finally you should check the labial bone integrity after extraction. You should do clinical evaluation. Yeah. Let's move on. Type 3 socket. Patient soft tissue and buccal plate of bone are both markedly reduced. This is a type 3 socket. Yeah. Can you see? This is a type 3 extraction socket. After this canine extraction, we will have type 3 extraction socket because of pre existing buccal bone defect and the buccal labial gingival resection. Because the soft tissue always follow the underlying bone. So if the bone will be gone, if soft tissue recession means bone recession. Here, after flap elevation, I could compound the severe labial bone recession. So this is a type 3 socket. Very easy to find out. So let's talk about timing of implant placement. Immediate implant placement. If you can place, if, if implant could be placed at the day of extraction, we can call that implant placement as immediate implant placement. When the implant is placed after soft tissue healing, about eight, four to eight weeks after extraction, we can call that implant placement as early implant placement. If the implant is placed after bone healing, at least three months after extraction, we can call that implant placement as a delayed implant placement. This is my classification, immediate, early, delayed. But Dr. Hemele introduced the new classification, type 1. Type 1 implant placement is the same as immediate implant placement. Type 2 is early implant placement, complete soft after complete soft tissue healing. Dr. Hemele self-classified delayed implant placement. Type 3 implant placement is, is implant placement after partial bone healing, about 3 to 4 months after extraction. If the implant is placed after complete bone healing, at least 4 months after extraction, that implant placement is type 4. But I usually use this immediate early delayed implant placement. No, this is my treatment flow after extraction. Right after extraction, we should check the bone defect. If there is bone, there is no bone defect, then means type 1 socket. But if there is bone, there is bone defect, we should check soft tissue quality. Sound soft tissue is type 2 socket, the leg of soft tissue, or recession of soft tissue is a type 3 socket. So no bone defect, type 1 socket. In this type 1 socket, immediate implant placement is best indication. Should be a first choice. Or sometimes socket preservation could be con con considered. But if there is some bone defect, we should check the soft tissue quality, as I said. So some situation we can do immediate implant placement along with GBI. But some situation, we should do delayed implant placement after complete soft tissue healing. So first, let's talk about immediate implant placement. This immediate implant placement is a main topic of today's session. Yeah, this is the definition of immediate implant placement. If implant is placed at the same day of extraction, this is immediate implant placement. So by placing implant right after extraction, we can get some advantages. We can reduce the number of visits in the dental office. We can reduce overall treatment period. And also we can preserve the bone at the site of implantation. But to preserve the bone, we should do something more. Implant cannot hold the bone. I will be talking about this 
in detail later. As I said, during very early healing period after extraction, this thin labial bone, 2 to 3 mm of coronal labial bone wall will be gone, right? Because this coronal portion of labial bone is mainly made of bundle bone. After extraction, the blood supply will be gone, so bundle bone will be gone. So you will have this kind of labial bone dissection. So let's talk about this immediate implant placement. We can put our implant at the inside the bone. For the early implant placement case, you will lose the bone, labial bone. For late implant placement, I don't like. You should do massive GBI. But to save, to preserve the labial bone, extraction is most, most important. So in the anterior region, for successful and simple and predictable immediate implant placement, you should extract the tooth well. A traumatic extraction should be done. So when grinding the tooth, you should grind, you should, when grinding the tooth, you should save the alveolar bone. So why should we do planless extraction and planless implant placement? And also why should we do a traumatic extraction? So let's think about the blood supply to this thin labial bone plate. The main blood supply is periosteum. Second blood supply is bone marrow. Inside the bone marrow, there are sufficient amount of blood vessel. So the, from the perfusion, from, through the perfusion from the bone marrow, we, this labial bone plate can maintain the blood supply. The third blood supply is a very minor blood supply, is a periodontal ligament. So after extraction, we cannot hold the blood supply from the periodontal ligament. But we can, if we can save the blood supply from the periosteum and bone marrow, we can decrease the amount of labial bone resorption after extraction and after implant placement. So to hold the blood supply from the periosteum, primeless extraction and primeless implant surgery should be emphasized when placing implant immediately in type 1 socket. But type 2 socket, we should open the plant, but only in the type 1 socket. Also, to maintain or to hold the blood supply from the bone marrow, a traumatic extraction should be done. We should not give any trauma to this labial bone plate because the basal blood, basal, sorry, basal blood supply is located at the base of alveolar bone, main blood supply here. So, a traumatic extraction with a special instrument. This is a periotome. To cut the only periosteum, do not crush it, the alveolar bone. So to cut the periosteum only, I usually use this periotome. Also, if possible, don't, do not elevate the prep. So if you give too much pause when extracting the tooth, in the ante an upper anterior area, you will cause the labial bone plate micro you will cause labial bone fracture, micro or macro fracture will occur. So blood supply from the basal artery will be decreased. So you will have severe more bone resorption severe alveolar leach atrophy. So, a traumatic extraction is most important factor for successful and simple immediate implant placement. So, I will show you my extraction technique. As shown in this video, this is Taiwan socket. 
the CBC TI could confirm the labial bone. Sound labial bone. This is a periotome. Insert periotome and mallet. Tap, tap, tap. To cut the only periodontal ligament. If I use the elevator, the interproximal bone was crossed. This is wide periotome. Start with very thin periotome and then increase the width like this. As the periodontal ligament is cut, this rootless became mobile and I could remove easily. In this way, a trauma fixation should be emphasized. Yeah, after extraction, we should place implant. So when placed implant in anterior extraction socket, we may experience these kinds of buccal rotator. Usually, we should place implant along the palatal wall, but TS3 is a taper body implant. In this day, the current trend of implant design is taper body. So when placing this taper body implant, just like a TS3, strong and hard palatal wall, palatal extraction socket, will pussy the implant coronal portion. So as a result, implant could be buccally rotated out. We may experience this one. So angulation of implant will last so good. So the position of implant will last so good. So drilling, during drilling, we should consider this, we should prevent this buccal rotating out. So we should place implant in the palatal side to get initial stability, to get sufficient initial stability, and also to get ideal prosthesis. Anyway, we will be talking about this palatal position of anterior immediate implant, implant later. Anyway, so usually with a lens drill, we should make an indentation along the palatal, extract, palatal wall of extraction socket, not root apex. Don't make initial drilling point at the apex. And then with the ostem side cutting drill, instead of this lens drill, we can use the ostem side cutting drill. Ostem side cutting drill has very sharp apex, just like a lens drill. So in this day, if you can use this new side cutting drill from ostem, you don't need to use this lens drill. With this new side cutting drill, you can cut palatal wall. You can cut the palatal wall apically and you can grind the palatal wall laterally. And then to prevent buccal rotating out, we should grind the palatal wall with this side cutting drill. And then taper drill should be used making contact with palatal wall like this. All drill should make a contact with the palatal wall of extraction socket. And then implant should be placed along the palatal extraction socket like this. The implant should be positioned under the single loom of definitive restoration, not under the incisor edge. So the shank of drill, we can call this area as a shank of drill. This drill shank should be positioned under the single loop, not inside of it. So when drilling, you should imagine the ideal shape of anterior prosthesis, and then the drill should be placed through the single loom of imaginary restoration. And implant also should be positioned under the single loom of definitive restoration, not inside the right. So this is my idea, my favorite implant position and angulation. As we all know, this is a single loom. This is inside the right. The implant should be positioned under the single loom. According to the implant angulation, implant position could be changed. 
So if you start drilling from the palatal wall, if your drill is tilted to the buccal side, this will be a final position of implant. So this is just acceptable. But how about this one? Even though you start, even though the drilling was started from the palatal wall of extraction socket, because of two buccal lip, two buccal inclination, because of two buccal inclination, the position is not so good. The coronal position of implant is not so good to make ideal and aesthetic crown. So don't place implant like this. So let's think about this case. In this case, if I drill like this, what will happen? If I started drilling, my initial drilling from the root apex, what will happen? The labial bone was perforated, so I should open the flap widely to the apex, and I should do GBR. And also, final coronal position of implant was not so good. So, sorry. So, to avoid this situation, I usually use this side cutting drill. Cut palatal side, make an initial drilling point at, along the at the palatal side of the structure socket, and palatal side cortical bone should be grinded. And then I place implant along the palatal wall of the extraction socket. So implant site preparation should be different. Yeah. Like this. So to evaluate the angulation of drilling, it will be much, much better to connect all drill to the drill extension, as shown in this slide. This drill extension should be positioned slightly palatally. Usually, when drilling, you should connect, you should connect the labial surface of adjacent tooth like this. You should make an imaginary line connecting the labial surface of adjacent tooth. So this drill extension should be positioned palatally to this imaginary line, like this. So by connecting the drill to the drill extension, we can evaluate the angulation of drilling easily. And then, after intermediate drilling with a 3.5 tape drill or 4.0 tape, tape drill, so after intermediate and final drilling, just before implant placement, if you really want to measure the angulation of drilling, you can put the taper drill to the drilling side. As I said, this is a drill shank. Drill shank should be positioned under the single loop, not inside the head. So let's see. This is a tight on the so I connected drill to the drill tension and now I make the initial drilling point with a side cutting drill along the color tile one. And then take the drill. Here, I made a drilling hole like this along the color tile one. And now I'm placing plant. You are the If you don't like your hot building angulation, you can so at that time you can change the angulation by using side control. This is lateral incisor. Can you see? This is the extension with the labial surface. Always draw the mineral line like this. And this extension should be positioned 
apply to the flashes. When placed in flat along the palatal wall of extraction socket. This is my drilling technique in the maxillary anterior extraction socket. So please place implant like this. Do your best to make a sufficient gap between inner extraction labial wall and implant like this. So after implant placement like this, after palatal implant placement, we should make a gap. We should have a gap. But how should we manage this gap? When managing this gap, after immediate implant placement, we usually refer to this jumping distance introduced by Dr. Botticelli in 2003. Jumping distance is this one. Jumping distance is a maximum gap distance, which can be filled with natural bone without any bone graft material and membrane. Jumping distance is known as 2.0 mm. So the gap is less than 2 mm. This gap will be filled with bone without any grafting. But when the gap is greater than 2.0 mm, this gap should be filled with the bone graft material to get complete bone healing. So let's see, if the gap is less than 2.0 mm, there will be a blood clot formation. And then this blood clot will be changed to the bone. Just like a jumping will occur. Bone cell jumping will occur. So the maximum gap distance which the bone cell can jump is 2.0 mm. So if the gap is less than 2.0 mm, bone cell cannot jump. So we should pack the bone. But in real clinical situation, in anterior, upper anterior area, we should consider one more thing. What? Labial bone sickness. So, usually in the upper anterior area, the labial bone is quite thin. In the Asian patient, most of Asian patients have very, very thin gingiva. But how about your country? In the Russia and Ukraine, I don't know exactly. But in the female patient, the labial bone will be thin, like this. Sometimes pre-existing labial bone defect. Here. As I said, this very thin labial bone will be gone during very early healing period after extraction because of blood supply. Loss of blood supply. So I wanna remind you guys all of this bundle bone theory. This is very, very important. Less than 1.0 millimeter labial bone will be gone. So how can it prevent this labial bone loss? Or can it prevent this labial bone loss? Actually impossible. But fortunately, by placing graft material inside the gap, we can preserve the labial tissue thickness around the implant. Let's talk about this one. So previously, about 10 to 15 years ago, many dentists strongly believed that immediate implant placement can hold the labial bone. So when I was a training doctor, my professor placed wide diameter implant in anterior extraction socket, 5.0 Brennan implant or 5.5. Implant diameter was same as root diameter. At that time, many dentists strongly believed that immediate implant placement can preserve the bone. But this is recent research about clinical and aesthetic outcome of implant, reported by Stephen Chen. Okay. Interestingly, Immediate implant placement does not prevent vertical and horizontal bone rejection after extraction. Implant cannot hold the bone, but bone augmentation may reduce the horizontal bone rejection. I think this bone augmentation cannot reduce the horizontal rejection, 
but bone augmentation procedure, bone grafting procedure can compensate the horizontal labial bone resorption, but not vertical resorption. So we should remember these two pattern, patterns. Immediate implant placement do not hold the bone. Bone augmentation can compensate horizontal bone resorption. Let's talk about this. So let's see in this case, I extracted lower second premolar. This is not anterior extraction socket. But as shown in this photo, very thin gingiva, very thin buccal bone. When placing implant in the premolar area immediately, the concept and should be same as anterior extraction socket. Anyway, this is a panorama. Let's see the CBCT. Very, very thin buccal bone. But how about lingual one? Quite thick. Thicker than 2.0 mm. Same as the anterior extraction socket. Anyway, to perform a traumatic extraction, I used this piezoelectric surgical tip for extraction to cut the periodontal ligament. And then I remove the root rest. A traumatic extraction was done. And then I could check the labial bone integrity. Labial bone was so sound, buccal bone was so sound. So I placed implant along the lingual wall and healing abutment was connected. Here, can you see? By performing a traumatic extraction, I could save this buccal bone and I placed implant lingually. Here, but three months later, what did happen? Even though implant was placed right after extraction, this thin labial buccal bone was, could not be preserved, could not be maintained. Here, three months later, can you see? Labial bone resorption was occurred. <laughs> here, here. So let's compare immediate post -op PC operative CBCT and three months after extraction. Immediate implant does not prevent vertical and horizontal bone resorption. So vertical position and sorry. So the horizontal position, labiopalatal position of implant is most determining factor to prevent implant thread exposure after labial bone resorption. And also vertical position should be considered. As shown in this research, here, before extraction, very thin buccal bone could be maintained because even though the, this buccal bone thickness is less than 1.0 mm, this buccal bone could be maintained. Why? Because of the blood supply from the periodontal ligament. So, around the natural tooth, very, very thin labial bone could, can be maintained because of the blood supply from the periodontal ligament, but implant has no periodontal ligament. So based on that point, that, that path, implant requires at least 1.5 mm buccal bone thickness, as Dr. Yuli Grunda said. So during the GBI session, I emphasized the thickness of Yuli from the buccal bone. The buccal bone thickness should be greater than 1.5 to 0 0.2.0 millimeter. Anyway, bone resorption is not avoided, not prevented with an implant alone. So we should do something more to hold, to maintain labial tissue thickness around the implant. So thickness of labial tissue can be maintained through bone graft. Here. Even though the implant was placed in the ideal position, ideal horizontal position, what will happen if you didn't pack the bone? Here. Sometimes very thin labial bone will be formed around the implant after thin labial bone rejection. But some situation, implant thread would be exposed after thin labial bone rejection according to the position of implant here. Yeah. In this case, in the immediate implant placement was done, 
without any bone grafting. So what will happen after thin labial bone disruption? You will experience this situation. If your patient has very thick gingiva biotype, implant thread will not be exposed outside gingiva. But if your patient has very thin gingiva biotype, as shown in this case, here, implant thread itself, implant surface itself could be exposed outside gingiva. So it's a complication. Here, I place the implant in lower canine immediately, right after extraction. At that time, when placing implant, I made a big mistake. I didn't manage the gap because at that time, I thought that the labial bone is quite thick, thick enough. So I skipped the bone grafting because I thought that labial bone thickness is quite enough to skip the bone grafting. But that was wrong. So implant thread was exposed after labial bone disruption. So once the low surface implant is exposed, there will be a high risk of soft tissue irritation, susceptibility to peri-implantitis will be high when the rough surface implant is exposed. Anyway, because of pre-recurrent gingiva swelling and bleeding, so I decided to open up the gingiva to check the, to check the condition. So as shown in this case, because of implant, lobe surface of implant was exposed, peri-implantitis was occurred, so, and severe bone disruption was occurred. So, GBR was done. And then, in the anterior area, aesthetic complication will occur easily. So, we should manage the gap properly. So, internal bone grafting is my favorite method. If we can place implant palatally enough, and also if we can pack the bone inside the extraction gap enough, we can make, we can regenerate labial bone around the implant, even though the thin labial bone will be gone. Here, after thin labial bone disruption, this bone graft material can make new labial bone. So, to make a thick labial bone, the thickness of this bone graft material is the most determining factor. If we can pack the bone with sufficient amount, we can make a thin labial bone. But the thickness of bone graft material is not, too, not enough. What will happen? Very thin labial bone will be formed, so the longevity or prognosis of this implant will be decreased. So, ideally, ideally, in theory, this is ideal. In theory, this is ideal method to make very, very thick and ideal thick labial bone with ideal contour. This is an ideal method in theory. Pack the bone inside the extraction socket and outside socket. But what's the main problem in real clinical situation? Leg of soft tissue. We should consider soft tissue. We can pack the bone, but we cannot close the plaque because of lack of soft tissue. But if you can close the plaque successfully, if you can get primary closure well, you can get sick labial bone. But this is unpredictable, unpractical. So to simplify the game management after immediate implant placement, please implant, place the implant palatally enough. Implant color should be apart more than 2 mm from the inner socket wall of the extracted tooth. Here, like this. From the inner socket wall, inner labial socket wall, to the implant, this distance should be greater than 2.0 mm. In this way, we can pack the bone with sufficient amount. amount. And the thickness of bone graft material will be greater than 2.0 mm. This is my method.